Hello everybody, welcome to the Alexi Cell podcast number 16 <laughs> and we are sitting here in my flat away in the arrival of Jeremy Corbyn who is going to be our guest today on uh, uh, I don't know, I was going to, first of all I thought it was going to be like you know, the A to, Z of, A to Z of politics and he could do democratic socialism D. You know, normally we just talk to academics about anarchism or Bolshevism or communism, but actually Jeremy Corbyn is actually somebody who's not just got an academic interest, but came very close to institute, instituting the uh, political philosophy that he espouses. Uh, but I think it'll just be... I think it, 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 uh, it, 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 uh, it dilutes the podcast just to make it part of the A to Z. I think it's just... It's all Jeremy... All the time. <laughs> <laughs> JC, all JZ, all the time podcast. Okay, nothing what? else, nothing more. No fan art, no Lego figures, no bike rides, no, <sighs> no, right, no we'll shit like that. Get to that next week then. Yeah. Um, oh, I say next week. It's been a while. Yeah, Hello, hello a listeners. While. Yeah. Um, I, every little movement outside the window, I twitch and see if that's Yeah, him. We're, all, we're like... We're like nervous brides waiting for the uh, the Rolls Royce <laughs> to turn up. <laughs> hey, no, 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 no. Linda's We're not doing here that. in the background. Wilf's too. here. Wilf's here. Everybody's the here. The whole entourage. Yeah, yeah. The whole. Uh, what sale. are you hoping this will be like, or well, to cover? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting. I, I think. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, we'll talk about politics and political. Positions and theories, but I just think that this is a man who has been through an experience that nobody else on the planet has really been through. Mm. And if he can reflect on that, I'm not saying that he will be able to or willing to, but if he is able and willing to reflect on that, I think that would be extraordinary uh, because he's never been allowed the space to do that, really. And also this, we are we are on the eve of the Labour Party conference, a, a conference oh. in which... Uh, Keir Starmer is going to attempt to enact all kinds of right-wing policies that will eternally lock the entire left out of uh, any possibility of political power, really. He's trying to change the electoral system. Oh, he's trying to change the electoral system. He's trying to make everybody wear pointy hats. (laughs) Um, He's trying to ban, I don't know. He's trying to get a Coca-Cola sponsorship. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to get sponsored by yeah, um, Lockheed Martin <laughs> defense systems. There's a stall sponsored by the Sun. I'm yeah, there's a stall sponsored by the Sun. I no mean, way! Fuck's sake! I know it's extraordinary. Uh, all kinds of shit, really. And we are on the very. Oh, this is now Thursday, twenty third of September. We are on the the edge of that. And, uh, you know, so it's... Uh, and Jeremy's not been allowed to go, right? Uh, no, he is. Uh, well, they can't stop him going. Oh, okay. <laughs> they can't stop. They can't have a roadblock outside Brighton. He is... Uh, he's gonna. Sp- he's not speaking at the conference, is he? Well, we can ask him, I suppose. Fringe. He's speaking at Fringe Meetings, which is the World Transformed, which is the Momentum uh, Festival. Just got a message. They're 10 minutes away. 10 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of surreal. Yeah, it's a bit it weird. Come yeah. round your house. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's very surreal for me. Yeah, uh, I can't believe this is happening. But also, no. I can because we've it, we've done quite a lot with this show. We've we've yeah. created some pretty magical moments. Yeah. And if he's to show up on any podcast, why the fuck not the Alexis Sell podcast? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're, I'm ho- we're hoping, aren't we? We both have this kind of fantasy that he's going to say something, that this is going to break really big and we're going to get like two million... <laughs> Headlines, yeah. Yeah, two million listens and it's going to break through and, you know, the MSM are going to pick it up. And, you got you know, aim high, come on. Yeah, well, at least in our fantasies. There's probably none of that is going to happen, but, uh, you know... That's All right. I think that's that's our joint that's our, our joint dream. I, I can't help but have this <laughs> nagging feeling in the back of my head that I'm slightly out of my depth. So um any advice or, or more any rules for me? Uh no, don't um any rules. No, don't uh 
Can I ask him if he's ever played Dungeons and Dragons? (laughs) That's the only question I want to ask. Really? (laughs) Well, maybe towards the end when we've run out of when we've run out of geopolitical matters about how we bring socialism and fairness to the dispossessed of the world. You can ask him about fucking Dungeons and Dragons. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not until then. That's him. Yeah, you get it. Do you get that when you go to the door? Hey, Carrie. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hello. I'm slightly over excited. Yeah. Are you over excited? Well. I've put the Jeremy Corbyn books. There are some tables here. I'm not kidding. Do you want to see your And how do you have a strong... Do you want to relate to the coming Yeah, don't worry. Whatever you want, really. I mean, you know. Of course. You're welcome to join us here. Do you want something to drink? Coffee, Alexi. Like Thank you, Jeremy. Black or white or uh, white. Just a hint of milk, there comrade. Yes, please. Oh. What, we need a, what, we need another couple of cups, I think. Jeremy, welcome to uh, Doughty Street. Thank you very much for coming. I've, I've dressed for radio, as you can see. <laughs> I remember when I went to a meeting um, when you launched your the 2019, and Diane Abbott, who obviously knows you well, spoke, and she said when when she met you, you bought all your clothes from the co-op. Yeah. She, <laughs> Is that... she often made... Um, any unkind comments about my clothes, you know. Did you get your hair cut by the council as well? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> you get your hair cut by his council. You just hair cut clothes, yeah, absolutely. But then it got worse that um, I was voted the worst-dressed MP in Parliament by a secret um, panel. Um, I got this several, several years running, and the late, great Tony Banks said... Corbyn dresses really well for Parliament and he's really conscious of the needs of our community. He's the one that wears the clothes that Oxfam rejects. <laughs> but then you were Beard Man of the Year, weren't I've you? Been, I think. I've yeah, been so. Beard of the Year quite yeah. a few times. I've, I've won that. It's been, sometimes there have been some close contests and my friends have got on the, you know, got, got on the close. Internet but you know, you're, you, know, you yeah. pioneered the, the great yeah, beard. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> So um, having a good beard is a good thing. Well, yours is pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. the point on your beard. Really. Yeah, no, it's sculpted. Well, I think well, you you've got more hair on your head than me because. But I think you know uh, if, when you get to my when you go bald, the on, the only option is baroque facial hair. Really, that's the only. So I have this kind of right. Van Dyke. You may find that. Well, the Van Dyke look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jalal is also got this. So, so I'm, I'm kind of lucky, really. I've got a bit of the um, above, isn't it? Yeah, both, yeah. Wilf is also here sitting in the doorway. He'd like to know how uh, well, he, we were talking about. He'd like to know how El Gato is getting on. Wilf, there. Wilf is it? Yeah, uh, Wilf Mabanga. You may know. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> well, if I'd known you were here, I'd have brought El Gato with me. And um, we could have had a, a play date, isn't it? Yeah. Well, they could have had a big scratch together, couldn't they? Because you know? <laughs> I, I find that cats are very possessive of their district. You know? Yeah. Well, he's also he's since we've been you know locked down, he won't. Uh, he won't, he's got used to us being here all the time now. Well, Elgato got fed up with us being at home. You know, sort of, you know by about 11 in the morning. Come on, you lot. Come on, you lot. <laughs> How did he... So, jo- as- jog on, you know. You're supposed <laughs> to be in my house during the day, you know. <laughs> no, he, he's um, defending the shed roof from all intruders. Wow, good for him. He does that every day. <clears throat> from other cats, you is, know. Uh, is- yeah, it's yes. quite hard work. He has to spend the whole day on the shed roof keeping the other cats off it. Yeah, <laughs> Tom Watson's cat is keeping. Up. Um, so anyway, um, we have known each other for many years as mm-hmm. uh, political comrades, but we've never. Re- I remember you showed me that cupboard. You took mm. me into that cupboard in the House of Commons. Oh, that you, you and Tony um, Ben Emily Wilde and Davidson hid. 
Yeah, and you put up a plaque. You and Tony Benn put up a plaque. Yeah. And then she was later, later run over by the King's horse. Yeah, she ran out and tried to thought the horse would stop in the derby. Bloody <laughs> thing she, didn't. She didn't know that horses don't have brakes. <laughs> and sadly, she died. But she the, the part that isn't often recorded is that her funeral in Morpus was massive, and her body was taken from where she was found dead in the hospital um, by carriage and so on to a train, King's Cross, and the streets were lined with right. people for her body to get on the train. And then the train went slowly north to Morpus and the Women's Social and Political Union made a lot of it. So there was purple bunting sure, all over yeah. and a massive funeral there. And so... She was, like, seen as a great martyr. Mm. Had we had television then, it would be not quite as big, but the equivalent of um, Princess yeah. Diana and her yeah. dress. Well, except they probably would have... Probably <laughs> they probably would have suppressed it. it. They probably yeah. blocked it out. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 but they would have... Uh... So, she, but... she was a very, interest, very yeah. interesting woman. yeah. Well, um, so, but we've never really... I mean, what I'm interested in, and obviously you can... Um, you, know, you you can you know talk about whatever you want, but I, I am interested in. You've been through an experience that nobody else has been through, in a way. I mean, and I know you're not necessarily somebody who talks personally about themselves, but I, you know, I am curious to know, you know, what was that like? You know, if you want to talk you know, on on whatever level you want to talk about the experience that you've been through the last five years, that all all our hopes and dreams <laughs> rested on you, um, you know, that you came very close to, to, to bringing about a kind of democratic socialism, or you're still in the process of bringing it about, and where we go from now, does that seem... It seems like a reasonable, reasonable, reasonable yeah. start of a 10, yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> actually, there's a quote from Owen Hathaway. This is what Owen Hathaway said, the, the architectural critic. Truly, I cursed Jeremy Corbyn and John MacDonald for inadvertently dragging me in 2015 into the world of people who have bookshelves lined with political biographies, follow polls, care who Neil Kinnock is, and think Philip Larkin is our greatest poet. I don't know why he's having a go at Philip Larkin, but being being simultaneously constantly angry and constantly bored is no way to spend anyone's time. And that's sort of my experience as well, to some extent, that I never thought about the Labour Party or never had any hope, <laughs> just kind of basked in cynicism. And then when you uh, came to power in 2015, I was suddenly filled with, uh, you know, this kind of extraordinary sense of of of, of, well, of optimism, of hope, really. And obviously it's been a rocky ride since then. Uh, you know, so I don't well, know where you want to start. Rocky ride, <laughs> well, it is, yeah. I didn't, I mean, I mean, for me, it's, I mean, I mean, for me, it has been a also a remarkable journey to see, I always knew the game was rigged. I never knew to what extent, to how, entirely it was rigged. And I don't know, do we start there? I mean, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, I stood for leader of the party because um, nobody else would of the left. Um, there was a big debate on the left about whether we should even contest the election at all. I was of the view we should, uh, just to show that we're still around. Um, and um, eventually the... Socialist campaign group, very small meeting, eventually said... They, it's like those 12 should, men in the boat that founded the Chinese Communist Party. Well, it was as many as, if we had 12, <laughs> we'd have been far more confident. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite a small meeting. Yeah. So John McDonnell rules himself out and said, no, I've done that. Diane said, I'm not doing it anymore. And I'm there with my little notebook. So I do everything with little notebooks. All oh, right, like okay, that's so nice. It's a nice little notebook. All my yeah. notes are in there, everything, casework, the lot. So I'm sort of writing stuff. Oh, that's, I was thinking, I mean, I, I mean, this is a complete... But stationery is how people people stationery is fascinating. So it's an orange leather band. It's an orange uh, leatherette, I think yeah. is the word. So yeah. I don't want to be able to get carried because there might be some vegans listening to this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's got here, for example, you were there last week, the... Stop, Stop the, the war, war, yeah. Yeah, it's got my um, my speech there. Oh wow! Is that pen? It's written in pencil, and it's 
like it's, shorthand. It's like it's not shorthand, shorthand but just know, notes. It's Ill- illegible, actually. Isn't it? <laughs> illegible hand. Is that Illeg- Arabic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it could be a lot. The problem is when I write these notes, I can't read them. Yeah. <laughs> I can't follow. I can't read it anyway. <laughs> and so I used to wind up Seamus Mill by saying, <laughs> I'm on my way to... Um, I'm on my way to Glasgow. I've got my speech ready, and then photograph the page in my notebook and send it to him. And he would then be sort of tearing his hair out. What are the media going to make of this? How am I going to deal with it? And of course, um, I can't read it either. <laughs> but the act of writing it puts the process in my mind. Right. So, so it's like a it's like a sort of brain insert okay. through a notebook. You should try it. Uh, yeah, well, my well, I mean, that was a, the triumph. The speech I gave introducing you at the mm. um, Palestinian the rally, uh, yeah, yeah, Palestinian yeah. rally, where when I didn't, I had no idea. I find speeches very difficult personally, but you know, when I said, you know, I was just busking really until I kind of said, I don't know whether the uh, for those who didn't see, it, I don't know whether the uh, the current leader of the opposition is here. At least I haven't seen the little shit bag. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the real leader of the opposition, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Corbyn. So anyway, so uh, that's that's so that's in my... 2015, I, I ran. Yeah. Put, my name was put forward because nobody else would do it. So as I'm making, making notes in my book, um, the meetings go on quiet. There's only about eight of us there anyway. So I said, so I looked up. So what are you looking at me for? <laughs> and pointed said, you've got to do it. You're the one who's pushed us into this position, yeah. so you've got to do it. I said, oh, all right. At that point, Diane Abbott goes like that. Tweeted out already. Oh, right. She drafted <sighs> the tweet and pressed send <sighs> at that point. God. She's sharp. Yeah. Diane is yeah, sharp. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Anyway, it, so anyway, so... So you, like, you, were, you were locked into it. So, but then, I mean, at this point, no, as you say, it's... Uh, it with an open, uh, open, yeah. open I mean, eyes. I'm, it was fascinating and exciting um and um it unleashed a whole whole lot of forces against austerity for peace for human rights for environment and so on who all came together in that summer of 2015 but how did it feel to you personally if i know you say that that um i mean it, it must i mean because it was a small meeting you're used to those <laughs> being on the left, um, and then suddenly there is this extraordinary kind of focus on you. That suddenly all these people are, the you know, you're suddenly the focus of all these people's hopes and dreams yeah. and beliefs. I mean, how did that? I mean, did that come as a shock? Were you surprised? Well, I take it as a responsibility that I'd taken on the position. I had to. Um therefore go out and do my best to win it. Yeah. Um, it also, of course, provokes um, a lot of extremely unpleasant media attention from the right, um, which, I mean, I've, I've had plenty of that in the past, but not never to this extent or that this intensity. And yeah. So it then became quite apparent that from two days after that, uh, my life would never be my own again. Yeah, I've been in situations which are only a thousandth, thousandth of as intense as what you've been through. But it, it, it's it's tough, isn't it? it? Really, I mean, nobody, I think, outside can understand. It, you know, just that, just that, the poisonous kind of the, the idea that there's people out there who really hate you, and also. Could you think? I mean, I think one of the reasons that it's sometimes why you they put you under pressure, your enemies, is that it makes it hard to think straight sometimes. Yeah, did you find and that they want you to conform to something which um, is unspecific what it is, but they want you to conform to something, and you therefore have to um, be strong and stick to what you believe in. Um, and so it's quite hard to stay focused on what you want to do. And in that summer, there was, it was like a sort of parallel life. We were trying to get nominations from MPs who were extremely reluctant to nominate me. Mm. Uh, we had to get 35. And at the same time, build a campaign which simply didn't exist. We, we had no campaign at all. We had my credit card. It lasted a week. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. But then things happened. People jumped up and did things. 
people, Ben Sellers and Seb, my son and others, got immediately involved in social media to try and get MPs to nominate me. Um, Unite, um, Jenny Formby and others got in touch and said they would do what they can to give me help and support very early on. Lots of people from all over the country got in touch and said, what can we do to help? And we just got on the road and uh, we were already locked into doing all these... um, formal debates that the election yeah. campaign requires. And um, I've never forgotten going to Nuneaton for the first of the television ones. It was a news night hustings in Nuneaton, Nuneaton, because it's a place we have had in the past and have got to win in the future. And um, Andy Burnham and Liz Kendall and um, so on were there. Um, and Yvette Cooper were all there. And they all had... They were so shit. I mean, massive, they were, I, well-oiled yeah. machines. They're yeah. this whole group of people, all sort of marching around them together, giving them printed speeches, giving them this, giving them that, and um, Seb, Andrew Fisher, Lara, and me turn up. Uh, and the the guy on the door of the BBC said, "Well, welcome, Mr. Corbyn. Where's your team?" <laughs> I said, and yeah, I mean, I said they're here. Yeah. They're here. <laughs> but that's precisely with all this machinery yeah. that Liz Kendall. I mean, there was. Just unbelievably fucking boring what they said. Or you, oh, we just you came authors, out with a clear yeah, statement. Yeah. We have got to end austerity. Yeah. And, and jumping, but yeah. And jump, I mean, I don't know whether you want to jump about on this, but I mean. I always jump about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we come to the current um, income. Yeah, we come to, you know, I mean, a man who who makes Liz Kendall, the current incumbent, in my opinion, seemed spark, seemed like Iggy Pop. <laughs> I mean, a man of such dullness uh, that the current leader of the Labour Party, the little shitbag. Uh... But leadership is about listening and about empathising. It's not about dictating. That was probably my big problem. But I'm in favour of democracy and listening. Um, quite a lot of people would have been preferred preferred me to be a bit more into the dictating. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, they're definitely, the, the, the plan is definitely a top-down rather than a, a bottom-up. So... You, so okay, so you 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 go to Nuneaton. I mean, you started this just to kind of make a point. You know, that, oh, this is what I've read from the fifty-seven books I've read about that period. I probably know it better than you in a way. That um, you, you you just thought you were making a point that, the, and they thought you know that's why you got the nomination from like Margaret Beckett and stuff. Um, because, you know, just to have the sham of having a left voice. So then, and you were making the point and you didn't think that, but then suddenly you started to think this is, when yeah. when did quite, you think so? Quite quickly, of, yeah. actually, because I was, um, first of all, pleased that we got to the position we were contesting, put my name in, and we then started getting some nominations. We were quite a way off, but we did, you know, obviously get there in the end. Um but it was the numbers of people who were just emailing, phoning and getting in touch saying, what can we do to help all over the country? And a lot of people in unions. And then perhaps one of the turning points was that um, there were many, but one was we at this um, hustings, Labour Party hustings for the Eastern region. It was in um, Stevenage, I think it was. And um, at the end of it, they said, right, final word from each candidate. It was me first and the others to go. And I said, um, thanks, everyone, for being here. When I leave here, I'm getting the train down to London because I'm joining the anti-austerity march. And since everybody has said here that they're very concerned about austerity, I hope the other candidates will join me. <laughs> Snap! Um, <laughs> they were all presumably going off. There was to... plenty of space on the train. <laughs> and so we went to to London for the rally and uh, and then when we were walking to join it because we got the train into Westminster then walked across in Parliament Square it was absolutely huge and then Mark Sawatka was chairing it and he then described in um, words of half a syllable that the process was you could become a registered supporter or join the Labour Party in order to get a vote uh, and he said, listen, guys, if you really want to have somebody who's opposed to austerity, you've got to do something, join or register. Yeah, yeah. And um, this massive rally then responded very well to that. And then I yeah. spoke afterwards. And it was at that point I, I realised that there was a broad, uh, I hate to use the word coalition, but broad embrace 
of people of the left, yeah. of um, different causes and groups that were prepared to come together and get involved in this campaign. And how, how did that well, make you feel? Well, it made me feel I mean, then that there was now a sea change in the whole thing. And the sea change was that, A, we were going to be on the ballot, we were going to get there, and we were going to give it a, a good fist. And then as time went on, uh, I mean, I, I don't, spend a lot of time reading opinion polls so I don't really believe them but um, I'm not a betting man at all but you follow the bookies right yeah. now somebody said follow the bookies anyway they started off giving me um, a thousand to one and some guy in my road put money down on a thousand to one wow did he give you a share no, he hustled the hell out of me for the whole of the campaign, <laughs> saying, please make sure you win. <laughs> Every time I saw him, he said, how's it going? How's it going? I said, what, what are you actually doing to support it? He said, I'm worrying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a fair... He, he, must, he must... I don't know how much he put down. Yeah. He must have made... A, whatever he put down, he must have made a lot. At first, I suppose, the media, because you're a novelty, treated you... Kindly, didn't they? Did you feel for a like few weeks? Yeah, for a few, were, yeah, it was for only a few, few weeks, weeks. They were relatively, relatively kind. Yeah, for a few weeks. But then you, you, and then they realised that how strong the campaign was, and um, how it was building up. From our point of view, it was uh, very hard to keep pace with it all, and so we. We had no staff. We had no. Yeah, team, we had nothing. It's a massive undertaking. I mean, again, I mean, running a you know running a, an imaginary sandwich bar as I do is difficult yeah. enough. Running a a campaign to you know to take over a, the opposition in a Western democracy must be so. We just very brought difficult. people in, volunteers, yeah. and so on, all came in, and there was yeah. a, a great buzz and a great atmosphere yeah. surrounding it. And, um, and well, at that we, time, you felt very <coughs> optimistic and yeah. on a and high we did this and, yeah. phone banking. Um, uh, it's with to Labour Party supporters registered and so on that came later on but that was an incredible operation and one night we had like several hundred people in the Unite offices in um, Hoburn phone bank and it was the biggest phone bank ever yeah. I and mean, it was just chaotic there was hundreds of people on these um, cheap as chips mobile phones phoning up people yeah, and phones. then recording <laughs> JC1 JC2 J whatever the choice of voting was and then we were tabulating all that and it was all looking very very interesting and, and very promising and so by um, somewhere into July, late July, August, it became a possibility, a possibility, no more, that a possibility that we would win it. And the crowds got bigger and bigger. Yeah, when well, I around. remember the meeting around here, that was where... It just got bigger. And then yeah. we had the, the, I don't know if you were there, that one at Camden. Then the, you were there. Were the you Camden. there, Lynn? I went to loads, I went to the Troxy. Yeah, every time we go past the Troxy, she's... And the um, state in Kilburn. Yeah. You got the film, yes. Yeah. And when we walked around the corner to go to the one at the Camden Centre, I was with uh, Simon Fletcher, who was the manager of the office and campaign. And we, he said, oh, we'll, we were in the TSSA, and we said, oh, we'll go around and get ready for the rally, the one at the Camden Centre. So we walked around there, and you see this big crowd of people. Yeah. I said, but well, is there a concert on or something? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, no, it's for you. I said, you're joking, you know. So we then had all these overflow meetings uh, and there was that great picture of these kids climbing in yeah. a window to get in. Oh, such happy days. We'll never... So you got the job. I got the job. In, in, <laughs> and then in, yes. <laughs> moving forward, what was that? I mean, well, let, let me ask you this question, which is obviously this was all about you getting the job. The Labour Party... The, the Labour Party. Labour Party. Labour. What's that all about? I mean, <laughs> what's, that, what's that all about? The Labour Party. What's you do particularly long podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, what I mean, I mean, I, I, because my I grew up in in further in, in in politics, which is further than to the left of Labour Party. So I never was showed much interest. It's only the last few years that I have. It seemed to me that the Labour Party and the history of the Labour Party might indicate that, in a sense, it is it, 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 it's purpose is to siphon off the socialistic instincts of the British working class and to bog them down in proceduralism, in kind of, you know, to, to enthuse them and then induce despair in them. On the other hand, I can see that it's, yeah. it, you know, you got that, you know, it's, yeah. it's the, the left 
has always had, you know, all these tiny, you know, the left is the place. Step. It is the place, yeah. Go. But how do you, I mean, how do you get beyond, you know, this process that you went through has happened several times before, and you must have known that, like George Lansbury in 1935, Nye Bevin was expelled from the Labour Party for support, because the Labour Party had a, a policy of non-intervention in the Spanish Civil War, a war against fascism. The Labour Party took a neutral fucking position, you know. Um, Michael Ford, obviously, Tony, you know. I mean, so how how do you... And I, I can understand why... Well, I'm not... T- yeah. Yeah. Well, the Labour Party is full of contradictions and its foundation was an interesting process of an amalgamation of a number of social societies and eventually with trade union support and then setting up what was a federal structure in... 1918, which followed by constituency parties. And originally, they were trades and labour councils. So it was a a trade union basis on which the campaigns were organised locally. But the Parliamentary Party asserted itself and the parliamentary party became the vehicle for electing the leader and there was forever after that a tension between party members unions and the parliamentary (laughs) party and that tension is there today yeah it it remains so and so the process of democracy in the labor party is a long-running uh long-running sore indeed i was a founder member of the campaign for labor party democracy in 1970 because we wanted to change that The Labour Party at its best has got to be a vehicle for social change. And um, I stood for leadership of it, fully aware of the power of the Labour Party bureaucracy, fully aware of the triumphs and the tragedies of of the past. I mean, I was in Parliament when we went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on and voted against it, obviously. Um, And um, my point was that we could now recruit a large number of people into the party we could use these um registered supporters as a way of hopefully converting them into members but above all turn the party into a community-based community Mm. organizing operation Mm. which um our later head of um chief of staff in my office carrie murphy put a huge amount of energy into trying to develop community organizing that met with huge opposition Mm. amongst the bureaucracy so go back a bit from the point when I was elected leader, there was a feeling of enormous elation, obviously. And um, I wanted to start as I meant to go on. And I announced to the consternation of all my team from the platform when I was declared the leader of the party, that my first act as leader of the party would be go to a demonstration saying refugees are welcome. Mm. Uh, And it's not that they didn't think refugees should be welcome. They just thought... To state that. This is... yeah. A logistical etc nightmare what on earth are you going to do that for yeah and so i looked at them all from the platform and said and now my first act is going to be that again. <laughs> you've anyway, never had media training i take it <laughs> no, no never any training in anything um so we went and did the rally because i yeah. wanted to make the point that i was not going to go down the road of appeasing the yeah. Right in politics, yeah. who build up this hatred of refugees. And I suppose the refugees are human beings like yeah. you and me. Yeah. In a different world, you and I could be refugees. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I would. Yeah. yeah. I would be and a your, very fam- bad one. your family. Yeah. yeah. Your family. Well, I was. My family were. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, my family are. Your yeah. family are. My Syrian cousins. So you know. Yeah. And yeah. It, hats off to you. Like I'm very grateful for your stand on that. Absolutely. Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, that's surely how we, we have to be. So I wanted to make that statement. Anyway, so I made that statement, spoke at that rally, and then started um, meeting the Labour Party senior staff, many of whom I'd never heard of before. <laughs> um, and then uh, the next thing was the construction of a shadow cabinet. Right. I then realised, well, I, I knew all along the, yeah. the problems we had. I, but it's like the fucking, you know. I dinner like, with John McDonnell that, that yeah. night with a lot of other people in Troy Air Restaurant, you know, the one by the South Bank. And um, I then it kind of hit but, home big time. How do we construct 
a team that will support what we've fought in this campaign. Yeah. Answer, you can't, because of look at the size of the Parliamentary Labour Party and attitudes in it. So that was a big problem. But as time went on during my leadership, it got a lot better. It got a lot better after the 2017 election. And so we got some good people in. Now, I know... 2019 was a disastrous result. Tell me about it. I know that. But had we won that election, look at the people who had become MPs in 2017, Mm -hmm. who would have been elected in 2019, you'd have a very, very different... um, But the the problem is they're never going to let... I mean, you had... You know, people in the headquarters conspiring against you, siphoning off money, you know, conspiring in many ways. You had the entire conservative press against you, and you had the, a lot of the people in the PLP conspiring against yeah. you. And the problem was that they were, ne- they, they were never going to let it happen. We had a huge range of opposition. That I, yeah. I know, of course, yeah. I do. From the media, um, 91% of the media was opposed, or maybe I'm exaggerating, perhaps it was only I 88. think you probably understand, yeah. <laughs> well, I understand. 173%. Well, I understand 5% media, yeah. were neutral, you see. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, and the level of um, attacks and misinformation in the media was... Unbelievable. ...was phenomenal. The I mean, lies, the there was, uh, And it was sort of like... Uh, some of it was kind of laughable, like the Daily Express said... He rides a Maoist bicycle. <laughs> I mean, I ride a bicycle. <laughs> and yeah, it's, a, it's bicycles a trek. don't have. I've got yeah. two bikes actually, yeah. and they didn't. I didn't tell them I got two bikes. That would have been. Oh no, whole, capitalist. Uh, that would have been a whole new set of socialist. Stories. Two yeah. bikes, two yeah. bikes, Corbyn. I've got a trek which is made in Taiwan, yeah. and a rally that's made in China. Right. So this became so, yeah. a Maoist bike. So it's the first Maoist yeah. bike made in Taiwan. Yeah, <laughs> it was like the case of Angela Eagle's brick. That was an early one. Do you remember that? There oh, was yeah, a, yeah. Angela's brick, where um, a, a, a left-wing militants threw a brick through Angela uh, Eagle's it is constituency alleged. office. It's alleged. It turned out there was no brick and no window. The Merseyside police diverted resources, presumably from you know, ex- you know. Ex, you know, investigating robberies and assaults, and you know, put the finest members of their team to investigate this fucking non-existent brick in a non-existent fucking well, window. The, the media harassment was unbelievable. I yeah. um, installed some new windows in the front of my house, which people are perfectly entitled to do. I applied for and received the appropriate consents from the local authority to do it. Okay, yeah, all fine. I had wanted to put a bay window in. The council refused permission. I didn't put it in. The Daily Mail then ran a story saying, Corbyn tries to despoil street. (laughs) (laughs) And then sent a journalist knocking every single door in the street, asking people to say how offended they were by the new windows being put in in my house. Yeah. And, and so this with the non-existent windows in your house that you the non-existent windows that you weren't putting into your house yes, exactly yeah, yeah. and uh, anyway I mean, my, what's the difference between, oh, yeah. my street's very loyal yeah. they told him to get to buzz off yeah so you could hear the sound yeah. of slamming doors all down the street as he went down I mean where's <laughs> the difference between that and you know I sometimes watch Russia today which has some interest you know you and you see you know a panel of experts they're all obviously on the government payroll or you know you know spouting the the Moscow the Putin line but you think really where's the difference between that and good morning britain you know or be you know sky news where's the where's the fucking difference it's exactly the fucking well, same what i'd hoped was and it, to some extent it worked was that the whole development of social media could begin to change the face of politics Because you and I have grown up in a non-social media age. I mean, when I was (laughs) a young political activist, to me, the height of political activity achievement would be to write a leaflet on my hand typewriter at home, which which my mum gave me as (laughs) a 16th birthday present, put that on a skin, on a yeah. Gestetner. Yeah. Gestetner, not Ronio. I always use Gestetner. Oh, the, the, the Gestetner was the uh, duplicator of the revolutionary movement. No, it, it was the go-to, it was the go-to <laughs> duplicator. And then I had a Gestetner at home, a hand Gestetner, yeah. which had seen service with the Eighth Army. 
<laughs> I, I, I don't know where to go with that, really. What, what, it was a very what, old one, is the point yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. I would then wind the handle for several hours whilst putting the ink on by hand. This was... This or oh, silkscreen, that was the other thing. Did you and then silk we do silkscreen? Yeah. Silk and then we'd produce... Anyway. <laughs> and then cut them with a yeah. guillotine, Those which had no days. guard on it, so we lucky our fingers remained. And then we would then go out and distribute these leaflets and think we'd done a great job, that we'd produced a leaflet, printed a thousand of them and given them out. A huge amount of effort for four people. You can press a button now and reach a million people immediately. Yeah. And so I believed uh, and i think there's a lot in it that social media can begin to change things it did for a while yeah it did yeah but all of us have got to think about this when it matters social media isn't there indian farmers on the cusp of winning yeah Uh, mysteriously yeah twitter facebook youtube nothing works on those particular streets of new delhi Mm -hmm. at that time yeah and the power to shut people down yeah. is is through that as well. And so that's why, maybe we'll come on to this, the Project for Peace and Justice, which I'm very, which I founded, is concentrating very heavily on the question of media access and media ownership and media activity and news values. Your point about news values, the experts sitting there all agreeing, austerity is a good thing. Yeah. So I filmed the other yeah. night on... Uh, um, Channel 5, I think it was, on life on a nuclear submarine. You've got to be an hour and a half into the film before anybody says, oh, by the way, the nuclear warheads on this are equivalent to half the bombs that were dropped in World War Two." Yeah. And that's all not mentioned. Yeah, it's all about, it's all about the, mentioned. yeah, it's just the jolly banter between it's the all, crew It's members. all about yeah. the, the yeah. quality of the food Normal. in the galley. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, so mean, you, sorry, stuff, yeah. I mean, did you, I mean, did you, I mean, because obviously you're, you know, you're deeply moral, um, you know, you know, very funny, very personable person. Oh, come on, I'm not funny. Or <laughs> Listen, I'm a bitter tongue, tongued old misery. It says so in the Daily Mail. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, that's. I mean, did <laughs> that you, must be true. Did you? I mean, did you try? I mean, the, the, I mean, whereas something like Tony, somebody like Tony Blair, fucking skull on a stick, somebody who has spent the last few years pimping himself out to real murderers, is allowed to be some kind of moral arbiter, is is vaunted as somebody who presents a moral mm-hmm. uh, position, mm-hmm. whereas you are where you know are excoriated as because mm-hmm. you want you know. You once bought somebody in Hezbollah a sandwich. I mean, I mean, did you try and get your? Did you feel that you? Did you try and get your that view of yourself out? Did was it blocked or did do you feel now that you could have done a better job with that? Well, I mean, I, I mean, sometimes think that Seamus Milne is a to be mildly critical. It was I don't know. It's an odd choice of you know comms chief in a way. Well, Seamus is a great comrade and great friend and is very good at analysing what goes on politically. To be fair to him and others, they probably would have wanted me to do more sort of personal stuff than we did. But I don't like yeah. doing personal stuff. Well, so just and just, so they yeah. didn't want me to be made into, it's all about me, it's, yeah, not, it's about yeah. a movement. I, I just, I'll tell you what, when I've been, when I've had legal troubles, when I was sued for libel, for instance, or I had accountancy troubles, I quickly learned to hire the biggest bastard you can find, the most aggressive, nastiest Rottweiler. Yeah. And I think that what you could have done with one of them and you didn't have one. I mean, because, <laughs> do, do you think? I don't know, is that unfair? There is a there is a point there. Um, but, you see, my instincts are that I want the next generation to be more empowered than this one. I want them to be more hopeful than this one. I want them to be more able to achieve a huge change. If you set everything up around one person, dictate what happens, and you might stay in office, you might stay in power, you might achieve some changes, but have you achieved a long-term change? Now, my whole project was about empowering and democratising, and hence I spent an awful lot of time travelling around the country addressing groups of people, round tables and all the rest of it, with the idea to enthuse them into being activists. Now, 
That is, I think, very important. Should we have done more and been more aggressive with the media? Listen, we were faced with an avalanche, an absolute avalanche of abuse. And uh, I, I just felt sorry often for James Schneider and others who worked in our office. They would be batting off one abusive, nasty, dishonest, horrible story about me or about Laura or about my boys, Ben Seven, Tommy or somebody, and they'd be the whole day dealing with this kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, you end up under siege. Mm -hmm. and when you're yeah. under siege, you don't have an awful lot of time or opportunity mm -hmm. to go out and sow the fields for next year. Yeah, and that, that's part of the part. Oh, which, yeah, of course, is it, part of what it's about. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, And it, they do it legally, they do it by media abuse, and um, tie you all in knots all yeah. the while. And so um, it is, you have to make a lot of effort to consciously try and develop new policies, develop activity. But I think, in fairness, we did a lot of that. Yeah. Despite all this was thrown at us, from 2015 onwards, and the coup in 2016, and all the hostility of the Parliamentary Labour Party, we set out a different strategy. I made the apology on Iraq, which I promised I would do and did on the day of the Chilcot report. And I promised I'd do it, and I did it, to an audience of uh, the families of soldiers who had lost their lives there. And in 2017, we produced an amazing manifesto yeah. for the many, not the few. Yeah, and um, that was all done under siege. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, so don't underestimate yeah. the amazing loyalty and work by yeah. people in my office and in my team, and also the negativity and backstabbing that went on as well. Yeah, and you know, yeah, that is a remark. I mean, when you put it like that, and I do, I think it's an extraordinary achievement with under that level of attack to 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 have got as far as you did. And I suppose it's a testament to you, the power of what you do. That the the sole purpose of Starmer's Labour Party really is not winning votes, is not fairness, is not challenging austerity, is not speaking for the oppressed. And nobody this, believed us in 2017 at the start of the campaign that we could win it. Yeah. Uh, and that oh, yeah, day, yeah. the day it was announced, I had um, various people coming up to me saying, why don't you just resign now? <laughs> I said, well, thanks for your support. I'll see you on the campaign trail. I remember this. By the way, which constituency do you represent? You know? <laughs> on election day, I remember the B a BBC correspondent going around Croydon and he couldn't find a single person to say anything bad about you. And it was, you know, so exciting. But what I was going to say was the entire purpose of the Labour Party at the moment, as we speak, is unravelling your... Yeah. Uh, legacy, isn't it? That's all they care about. It is the only fucking thing that they Well, are. I'm looking forward to being in Brighton because I've got a few meetings and rallies coming up in which uh, um, I want to take it f f further forward. Listen, yeah. austerity has meant food banks and food co-ops. Austerity has meant shorter lives. Austerity has meant unbelievable levels of poverty in Britain. And underfunding of local government means councils simply cannot keep that, going. I mean, and that was the, yeah. and I'm going to say all that. Yeah. And they, we don't we don't defeat that yeah. by pleasing the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. Yeah, which like fucking Ed Balls and Ed Miliband in twenty whenever it was twenty fifteen, wouldn't he? Because some fucking focus group or something had told them that you know they allowed the Tories to say that Labour had caused you know I mean it's that my line that James O'Brien always quotes about the worldwide financial crash of two thousand eight was caused by Wolverhampton having too many libraries. Yeah. I mean it's and and uh, because those two. I'm glad you revealed the truth about that. <laughs> yeah. I've always okay. thought that that library in Technol is a bit excessive. That's what that's what it's tipped not, it. It's strictly what, not necessary. It's not in the centre of Wolverhampton. It should be moved. That's what tipped the world. Will you come there and help me move it? Yeah. But those two idiots fucking allowed the to what yeah. for some Weasley. That's one of the other thing I want to say about Blair. Half man, well, half also, weasel. Also, we went into that election <laughs> promising to continue the wage freeze. Yeah. I mean, the cowardice of that. So we go into an election, and uh, I remember a 2015 general election. There was some good stuff in the manifesto, no question about that, there was. Yeah. But uh, somebody, I remember knocking on a door on one of the estates in my constituency, and the person comes to the door and says, yeah, I said, OK. He said, yeah, I'll vote for you, Jeremy, yeah, yeah. I said, where do you work? He said, oh, DWP, said, OK. He said, um, I'm just a bit unhappy about the wage freeze. So I said, why? 
He said, I haven't got any money. <laughs> and, 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 I see, and I see my income diminishing before my eyes. And he was right. Of course, yeah. he, of course he was yeah. right. Yeah. And, um, and but so, start with this uh, new... So you think, hang on, what are we offering? Yes, we were some good yeah. housing policies, but unless you actually put money in people's pockets... Yeah then you have a, a double whammy. One is they're poor. The second is the local spending power is reduced and yeah. local shops close and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, and, and Starmer's not even offering that. I think he's not even offering the bollocks of the two heads, really. Mm. Um, yes, so, well, <laughs> what, what should I ask now? <laughs> what? Go on. like a lot of people on the left at the moment, you know, the purges and so on. I'd like to know what you think we can have as hope. I want some more hope, please. And what, Carrie? What, what's good at the moment? So, oh, obviously there are seven uh, unions on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, we've held back the, the creation of, because uh, there is a voyage at us, right? <clears throat> we've held back the creation of the organisation because we need Jeremy and uh, as part of the leadership. Would you mind answering that over here? <laughs> Carrie, come and sit here. You no. see, this is, this is, she's wonderful, but she can be a rock violer. This is your Alistair Campbell. Is that, you play you the call band. sweet Carrie Murphy. <laughs> I, call, I call her sweet Carrie Murphy, yeah. but... Um, You're his bastard. You're his, uh, his enforcer. No, 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 no. I'm All right, so, a very kind person, but I get this Carrie reputation. Carrie is an unbelievably kind person and does kindnesses all the time, which she doesn't even tell people about. Yeah. I hear about them from others. Yeah, and again, that's not, you know, that, that's never... I you wouldn't know about that in the media, no. would you? You never hear that. She's got family in my area as well, so I hear about her kindnesses. No, I mean that's 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 one of. I mean, that is one of your problems. I think is that you you're all too nice. But um, Linda joined the Labour Party. It was a roller coaster ride of emotions for her, particularly meeting the right wing of the Labour Party, uh, who she said are some of the most horrible people she's ever met. Or the most horrible people to remember. But she, so she was, you know, with the defeat in 2019, she is, feels depressed and demotivated. What can you offer in terms of hope? It was devastating, of course. 2019 election result. We got 32.5% of the vote. We got 10 million plus votes. Um, and obviously we lost seats. Um, with that vote we would have won every election since 2001, but yeah. it's the seat arrangement. Of course, the, again, arrangement. the MSM doesn't mention that, you know. Of course not. Greatest catastrophe. So it was more votes than achieved by Blair or Brown or Miliband. Mm. Okay, even then. Okay. So, um, obviously, I take responsibility for losing the election. I was the leader of the party. I, I led the party in, into the election. And I just knew that as soon as that result had come round, there was going to be a whole feeling of devastation and depression um, amongst activists. And so I set myself up immediately on a course, which Carrie will attest to, of going around the country supporting people and doing rallies and things to try and boost people up, which is what I do all the time. COVID came along, which obviously has changed an awful lot of that. Winning an election would have meant we'd gone into government gone into government probably as the largest party, probably not with an overall majority. So we would have had to live or die by being a minority government. We'd have set ourselves a, a budget that would have been redistributive and all the other things in our policy. We would have had the most unbelievable attacks from mm. the media yeah, that, that, and many other very, very powerful forces in our society. Yeah. And so we would have needed the active support of communities and people all over the country to win. So well, the point I'm making is that being in office doesn't automatically bring you the power to make the change. The power to make the change comes from the popular will that goes with it. Yeah. The two things go together. Um, we would um, have had a lot of problems. And so I simply say to people, are, I want to defeat injustice and inequality. I want to see um, something real coming out of COP26 and something real about environmental protection. And I want to see us moving to a peaceful world, not a new nuclear pact with goodness knows who to do God knows what. Um, we only achieve all that by 
mobilization of people. And so I recognize the devastation. We set up the Project for Justice and Peace as a home for people. I don't know how many of them are in the Labour Party or not. I'm guessing it's probably 50-50, but I don't know. But there are people all over the country who are involved in real political activity, organising delivery workers into a union, fighting for union recognition, setting up food co-ops, setting up clothing co-ops, demanding stuff for COP26, international justice. We did a refugee call. We had 10,000 people on it. I did a speech with Lula and Dilma in Brazil. We had 500,000 people on one meeting we did. So we're building up this sense of alliances. And when you build an alliance up, you empower each other. Right. You empower each other. We, I, I did one, one Saturday night from people in Manitoba in Canada. I've never been to Manitoba, but I looked it up on the map. It's big. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. It's massive. Yeah. Look at it on the map. And I was speaking to Nikki Ashton, who's the MP for there, who has been re-elected, I'm glad to say. And, um, and so I kept wanting to ask questions about Manitoba, and she said, Jeremy, can you get on with the politics of it and stop asking questions about Manitoba? And she said, you don't realise how important it is for our scattered people all over Manitoba to hear that their views of a sustainable world, their views of justice are actually shared by people elsewhere. And so yeah. we do that. Yeah, well, I was at a Palestinian many places Absolutely. in Palestine last night and they, they said you can't, you can't overstate if if somebody speaks up for Palestine, yeah. you can't overstate how much that means to them. Exactly. Really. Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, first and time I went to it. Jerusalem, yeah. um, I wasn't leader of the party or anything. I used to have a beautiful green jacket. It was lovely. I love my green jacket. The trouble is, my wife hated it. It was horrendous. To be honest. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What is now at that? Uh, it in, disappeared. <laughs> It's now in the it was, green jacket, it was purg- about a seedo. green jacket purgatory somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, I'm so proud of this green jacket. You bought jacket, it from Gum else... in Moscow, or <laughs> <laughs> Road, actually. Um, so um, I'm walking through the old town in Jerusalem, and this guy shouts, "Mr. Jeremy!" Because he spotted the green jacket. All right. So he, oh. he came out and literally dragged me into his cafe, yeah. sat me down brought out the coffee, brought out the cakes, and just said, thank you. Right, yeah, yeah. Because and yeah. you're one who recognises what the occupation is like. Yeah. He just, I, I, so he, we then, the only argument we got into was he wouldn't let me pay. <laughs> no, well, he you're a generous people, aren't you? Yeah, Tell our he just you do, he just would not yeah. allow me to pay. And I said, no, "You've got to expect." I said, "You're not making any money. There's no tourists. The whole place, the economy is collapsing." He said, "I cannot take money from you." Yeah, well, that's you know, yeah. Uh, Carrie, you um, you, I mean, because your background is in the trade unions. I mean, do you see uh, you, some some hope there? Yeah, I think you, um, I don't think you can adopt a a negative uh, view on membership engagement within the Labour Party at the moment, although people are very demoralised and trade unionists are are clearly with COVID, you know, have massive challenges. But there's, I think, the scope for optimism because Mm. Keir Starmer uh, has duped an awful lot of people, but not all of them. Uh, I don't think you can erase the content of Jeremy's manifesto in, in 17 and in 19. Uh, both of uh, you know both documents been very very popular with the vast majority of people, and of course the British media's propaganda telling ordinary work the ordinary working classes that these documents are not relevant to their lives. Of course they are. Mm-hmm. People have an intellectual insight into what is best for them, and I think personally that. Uh, Having peace and justice is really important, but so is having the British Trade Union movement. And seven yeah. of the big unions are very, very much on the left. And mm. if I say this on behalf of Unite in particular, Sharon Graham's election for you into you know the general secretaryship of Unite is very exciting for me. Mm. People want to believe that Sharon is not political. It's not true. She will just do things in her own way. But what we have done in relation to Sharon is the model that we use for community organising in the Labour Party was Sharon's model. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to how yeah. uh, you know peace and justice can work with Sharon going forward but there is a void at the moment and clearly the left are feeling bereft um, you know of activism because of the, there is that void of leadership that will find its level very <coughs> soon 
That will find its level because Keir Starmer has betrayed the left and people are bright enough to recognise their misdemeanor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think one of the things you can feel hopeful about is that they're, <coughs> they're doing such a shit job. Yeah. I mean, they are yeah. so fucking useless yeah, at even being troughs. bastards. Yeah, there yeah. are peaks and troughs in the Labour Party. Yeah. And, you know, I'm keen for Jeremy to uh, be back in his rightful place within the Labour Party. There is a, a left block oh, of MPs. There are some fantastic, you know, young MPs like Zara and Richard and Dan Cardin and others. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, yeah. And, and many others, absolutely. Probably at this stage too many to mention, which is <clears> great. We worked we worked hard to, to make sure those voices were in Parliament. But the seven left trade unions will come together with Jeremy and John and others. We'll have the manifestos that, you know, we worked very hard on in 17. People cannot dismiss the minute the Daily Mail says it's one lot of shit. People out there know it's not true. So I remain optimistic for the future. Am I shocked and horrified about, you know, uh, Keir's betrayal? Actually, I'm not. You know, that was that was masquerading. Uh, there is a, there is no doubt there is a purge against the left just now. Well, well that, that's well, incredible, that isn't it? That that, mem- that, uh, that JVL said, if you're a Jewish socialist, you are two hundred times more likely than anybody else to be expelled from <laughs> Labour Party for for hatred yeah. of Jews. I, I mean, what kind of Kafkaesque bollocks is, is that? Totally But you know what? I, I'm out and about as Jeremy and I live in the Gordbos, and I'm out and about. People can see right through this. Gone are the days when they're going to kid these people on. You know, my biggest fear for the Labour Party is the absolute drubbing it's going to get come the next general election. You know, I don't fear as a left winger my future. I fear for the future of the Labour Party. I don't feel defeated. If the Labour Party do not represent working class people, they are nothing. They are without purpose. I don't feel defeated any more than Karen does. No, absolutely not. I I travel a lot. I mean, I'm I'm all over the place all the time travelling. And... um, a number of people that come up to me and just say, you know, really sorry about what happened, what you said was right. More interestingly, people come along and say, I thought you were wrong at the time. I now realise mm. the sense of what you were saying in the 2019 election. Yeah. They see the NHS yeah. being sold off to Circa and everybody else. Yeah. They say, well, actually, you're the one that predicted all of this. Yeah. 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 You remember that document I brought out against Johnson? Yeah. showing the secret negotiation I had with the USA yeah. to sell off the NHS. Yeah. Where were our media picking that up? Yeah. The ridicule. The ridicule. It's come from Russia. Yeah. I really struggled with that one. Yeah. <laughs> How did Russia get involved in producing a document about secret talks that Johnson was having in the USA about our NHS to give to me to use at a television debate in Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I never met one Russian all day. <laughs> well, I think peace and justice is a, is a, a holding place yeah. for people who have the, got the same values and principles as we have. But the British Trade Union Movement, organised labour yeah. is key to this. And we will work in partnership with organised labour and we will community organise because the link between us and the working classes is imperative. And if Keir Starmer doesn't recognise that that's how you win a general election, he will never win a general election. Well, I think that's There will true. be an opportunity for the left again. So our our asks to people is if you're not in the Labour Party be in peace and justice be in both if you want but if you're not sure. in the Labour Party join peace and justice and yeah. there's no secret plan for peace and justice to spin off into a new party there's no secret plans of any sort it's, my desk is small and very open and yeah. they look at it every day the secret plan is for Jeremy Corbyn to be back in the Labour Party and we we will work with the British trade unions on the left going forward. The secret plan is to mobilise people yeah. as a mass movement. Whatever happens after that happens. Tomorrow, young people are going to be in central London. Mm. Climate change. Scarlet Westbrook has organised it. Wonderful young woman. She invited me to go there. I'll be there tomorrow. We've got all these events in Brighton next week, which are going to be outdoors. Yeah. we a big rally on Sunday afternoon. And then we're going to be doing rallies and stuff in Glasgow around COP26. And we do a lot of international stuff. I was on an earlier call about uh, the occupied territories and um, I'm doing a meeting this evening about the new nuclear deal. So we are very, very active on all these things, on social justice, on housing, supporting ACORN for tenants and and so on. And our project is inundated with requests for help and support. I'm very comfortable with that. Being inundated with help, with people who want help and support, fine, that's what we're there for. It's not a problem for us, it's a, it's a pleasure. I mean, it's obviously logistically all very difficult all the time, but that's life. Mm.
Yeah. But I think what is... I mean, I remember, remember being asked a question once or somebody said, you know, you're under enormous stress. And this was during the coup in 2016. I said, no. No, I'm not under stress. I've got food in the fridge at home. I'm not going to starve tonight. And if everything goes totally pear-shaped, I've got a house to live in. When you're under stress is when you're a, a triage nurse in a hospital and you haven't got enough beds. When you're under stress is when you've got mental health problems and your kids are acting up and you've got nowhere to live, you're homeless, and your kids are going to be taken into care. That's stress. That's the kind of stress that the newspapers never, ever report. They always put stress down as something that sports people or celebrities are going through. The mental health crisis in this country is as much brought about by poverty and inequality as it is from any sort of medical condition. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah. I I think the other thing that's never said about the project, early, you know, our administration had, you know, there was a lot of crisis, and you're right, but we were besieged a lot of the time. It was a crisis every but day. But by God, did we get some fantastic moral support from ordinary people who made us smile every single day. You know, it wasn't a drudgery, was it, Jeremy? Yeah, you know, we went in there and, and we had... after the election in 2019... We believed in it so much. We had... Um, we had some fun. Boxes and boxes mm. of Christmas cards. <laughs> We opened 10,000, mm. <laughs> just tons of cards. Most of them with no address on, just a message. Mm. And 99% of them, the mirror image of the British media, were supportive. Yeah. Mm. And it was you, extraordinary, wasn't it? You remember yeah. And we emails coming yeah. out of your ears. You could feel the love in the streets. Yeah, yeah you could feel that. It's tangible. Hello, listeners. It's me, Talal, from the Alexis L podcast. And I'm sorry to interrupt this chat with, um, who was it again? Oh, yeah, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and I promise I won't be long, but I just wanted to pop in here and remind you the best way in which you can support this show. And that's by visiting our Patreon, of course. Look, we really don't want to have any adverts on this show ever 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 and really the best way we can do that is to turn to you for support because you know everyone who helps makes the show needs to make a living and we buy certain equipment especially for the bike rides as well and of course audio boom takes a fee because we're not getting any adverts and etc etc podcasting ain't cheap yo and so, look, we really, really, really appreciate everyone who's already subscribed to the Patreon. We love every single one of you. You guys are awesome. And if you want to join the party, get on board. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Sale podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Sale podcast. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's it. Follow us on Instagram, Sale pod at Alexis L Pod on Instagram. I like to post little things there, keep you guys posted, little clips from the show, maybe behind the scenes photographs, fan art, stuff like that. Okay, I'm done. Let's get back to our chat with Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. The, uh, the the president of Mexico is um, a mate of yours, isn't he? Mm, Gramlo, yeah. Yeah, I mean that was sort of another. Bit. I, yeah. I've seen, I've seen managed, I've seen, I watched Sicario last night. I've seen it before. Yeah. How does he oh, manage got, to govern Mexico? Oh, with, with some in, difficulty. With some difficulty. <laughs> At least you haven't got the cartel. Well, you have got different kinds of cartels. Yeah, who are even more. Well, busy. Lara, my wife, says yeah. that the political pressures and abuse in Britain and the West. Are, are probably worse than Mexico. Because really? in Mexico, it's very obvious. Yeah. It's very obvious who your enemies are. It's yeah. very obvious who your friends are. Yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah. So they, know, yeah, the old they, saying, never smile yeah. at a crocodile. Yeah. Uh, don't be taken in by his friendly grin. Um, 
The day before... So the Matamoros could tell are not as bad as Labour First? (laughs) (laughs) That's what you're saying. um, With um, AMLO, the day before he became president, and we we went to his house in Palenque, and then we travelled together to Mexico City. And I've I've known him for a long time. We got on very well. And so we're travelling and talking about his hopes and so on. And And I said, well, God, you've got a lot coming up how do you feel about it he said nervous and excited as you as you were Uh, and he said i said is there anything you want that we can help support with and so on this was um the year shut up well some while ago and he said can we have your nhs (laughs) (laughs) can we have your nhs because mexico has no comprehensive health system yeah and yet it's hasn't it got the richest man in the world in carlos slim yes i think there's a connection here yeah between them (laughs) all the money that would have gone to the uh health service in mexico has gone three medical appointments half an hour a week on thursdays Mind you, I probably having slagged off carlos slim am i getting am i going to get hit by the zetos cartel now (laughs) <laughs> I won't give you. I won't. I won't give him your address. It's all right. I'll keep your your addresses secret. So. <laughs> Much as gracias. Lynch, is there anything else? I mean, is, are well, we? Some more? I'm, I'm agreeing with all you're saying about the the, the the fire that's been lit around the country. But is what I cannot see is any place for the left in the Labour Party. I mean, that seems to be the sole aim of the current regime is to make sure the left has no place in the Labour Party and will not... This has been tried before. Yeah. Uh, Gate School tried it. Um, they do, tried it after Lansbury. Yeah. Um, Atlee, Sorry, if I'll try to just paraphrase. Linda's just talking about how the, this concerted effort to remove the left from the yeah. Labour Party. And you're saying yeah, it's... Forever. Yeah. Forever. Yeah, this time, they think, you know, why won't it work this time? Sorry, Jeremy, I, I, I shouldn't respond, but I, I will no, do, respond. Do. In the absence of an alternative, the left should remain within the Labour Party. And the only alternative will not be a peace and justice project, but organised Labour. And if they provide us with an alternative, of course, the Labour Party has no God-given right to exist. But the vast majority of people that I feel who are, who are experienced and having been done over year in, year out, feel that until there is that alternative there, the home is in, the natural home is within the Labour Party. And, and what I've said before <coughs> again is the advantage that we've got is we know it can work. Sure, we made mistakes. We will be wiser the next time. Is there another opportunity? I believe there will be. If there is an alternative out there from organised Labour, then people can move like that. Right, but, but... Is the Labour Party this alternative? Because at the moment, the pe- I mean, all my comrades have been expelled, you know? Yeah, there so, is a part. You know, there is, so, absolutely, you know, there is sure, a part. Yeah, but the finest and the best as well. I'm very upset about a particular comrade who died yesterday. Um, who was it? Reva, you know, you probably come across Yeah, I was Reaver. with... Um, yeah. Um, a comrade in Hastings on uh, Sunday night. We were talking about that. Shame on Keir Starmer for the purge in the left. Shame on Keir Starmer. Her, Shame on David Evans. Yeah. There is no doubt I am not here to defend the structures no, of the Labour Party. I think, I think you say, so, so if you stay, you're not only giving some kind of money and tacit support, you're also in danger of being labelled like a racist, like an anti semite I mean, yeah. that's it's so upsetting that you know mm-hmm. these decent wonderful people who anybody would be proud to stand alongside are being treated like that you know so it's a big ask saying stay until you're thrown out it is a it's, big, it's a big ask it is a big ask and yeah. jeremy and i have both been there and jeremy yes. at this moment in time you know yeah. perversely remains uh Without the whip, I I do not defend the Labour Party and I absolutely do not defend the actions of David Evans or indeed Keir Starmer. What I say is, as a personal view, unless organised Labour offers an alternative, watch this space in relation to Sharon Graham. The Bakers, Mm. the Fire Brigade Union, Changing Unison. These are all, I think, (coughs) very interesting moves. Watch this space. But there is nobody going to push me out of the Labour Party right now, no matter what they throw at me, until there is an alternative. That's my view. I was in Liverpool for the march against the arms fair. And there were a lot of people, a huge, huge demonstration. 
and from and it's a great city. And what was interesting was that we marched into the centre of Liverpool. Now, Alexa, you've been on lots of marches in London. You know what it's like. You go down, you go down Oxford Street, and you, you come, you've got this great sense of camaraderie when you're assembling in Hyde Park, and then you set off down Oxford Street, and you get all the crap and abuse and everything else from people shopping. You know, mm. you know, you know how it goes. And, uh, and then shopping. We so we're walking through the middle of Liverpool. And I'm sort of expecting, why don't you lot get lost, go away, get bigger bombs or whatever. People coming out of the pub, applauding. Yeah. And joining in. Now, that's different. Then I went to Wigan for the Diggers Festival. Okay, it's a left-wing festival. Okay, it's a community event. Okay, it is self-selecting. There were thousands of people there from all kinds of um, groups, some in the Labour Party, some not in the Labour Party, all kinds. They came together. Why? Because they were interested in a festival, having a good time, interested in the history of the diggers versus the levellers versus Cromwell, etc. But also, they were mainly campaigning on mm. stopping the cut in universal credit, saving the local hospital, yeah. Yeah. demanding a national care service. And the biggest cheer I got was when he said, I'm fed up with going around the country defending the NHS. I don't want to defend the NHS. I want to extend the NHS mm -hmm. and take over private medicine. I want to extend the NHS and have a real national care service. I said, let's campaign for things, not just mm -hmm. against something. Yeah. Give people something positive to do. Are we... Yeah. yeah, we all agree with that. It's, it's I, making I always, it happen, isn't it? I always... Uh, well, I relate to that because I'm always, people, whenever I have a friend, I, I don't know, this, we might cut this up. Whenever I have a, fr whenever I have a <laughs> well, friend, almost certainly. I say friend, whenever I'm in the pub and some dickhead <laughs> makes a a, a, a a racist joke or like an anti, like an anti-Semitic joke or something fucking awful. And then because I'm the Arab, they'll look at me yeah. and they go, right, right. <laughs> and I go, no, fuck you. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to. You need to change your pub. <laughs> but it's like, it doesn't happen often, but I guess yeah. it used to happen more than it does now. But like that kind of vibe where people expect me as the Arab to be anti Jewish or oh, right. ve vehemently anti Israeli, yeah. even. Yeah. And I'm like, actually, I don't want to allow them or anyone to put that hate in my heart. I'm not anti Israeli. I'm not anti Jewish. I'm. I'm pro-Palestinian, and those yeah. are very different things. Yeah, totally different, absolutely. And uh, you don't you don't put that hate in my mouth or in my heart, you know, like, please piss off with that. Don't look at me for approval with that bullshit. And uh, so I really relate to that. Let's campaign for things. Let's support people rather than try and destroy and t tear things down. Um, now look at the history of people who were fighting racism in this country. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be in uh, the, the East End for the uh, commemoration of the Battle of Cable Street. What was mm -hmm. that about? That was an Irish community and Jewish community coming together to defeat Mosley and the fascists. They're trying to march through the East End. Yeah. And who's going to be there? Lots and lots of people, including a very large number of people, no doubt, from the mos East London Mosque and from the whole area. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Unity uh of communities. I was often, I would talk to Josie Long about this, as you know, as a supporter as well, that the vehemence of the hatred towards you, and I, I tried to kind of find a, a reason, you know, a psychological reason, why it's, and I think it's because you showed up, you and obviously the people, right? you know, you showed up, people thought they were left-wing, and you showed them that they weren't really. <laughs> Journalists thought that they were independent, and you showed them that they were just glove puppets mm. and that's one of the reasons deep down the contempt the people showed for you you know like particularly like bastards like Peston or but Alexi you know, this is why we've got to do so much more on the media and why we're having this event in Manchester on October the 4th 4th of October 4th of October yeah at the People's uh, History Ale Museum Ale Alexia is right though it is it is a mixture of terror that you might actually succeed in shame that people who were masquerading as some sort of kind of liberal lefty, you know, North London socialist actually are as much part of the establishment as the right wing was. Yeah. So I subscribe to that. I agree yeah. with that. And Jeremy is yeah. genuinely probably to, um, you know, your 
he's too humble to admit this, but history will judge Jeremy Corbyn very fairly and very yeah. warmly. You know, the scales will pop, fall from people's well, eyes. Will I be around for that judgment? <laughs> I sincerely hope so, but one thing I do know, Jeremy has your three boys, well, and that's significant yeah. to the young people who have supported well, him. But it is that, that, that vehemence, it's like... It's like nobody says, I fucking hate carrots. Fucking carrots! I can't fucking stand <laughs> them bastards! Racist fucking carrots! You know, nobody, it's, it, it's, it's because, you know, Jeremy showed up to people that they were, that they were it's a journalists. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's it was a, a mirror that they were bought and paid for. Showed them up yeah. and they can't, people will do anything to avoid looking in that mirror. Yeah. To seeing themselves as they truly are, they will drink themselves yeah. stupid. They will do whatever they can to avoid. We that. have the That's least trusted media in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Can I can I well. give them an exclusive? Would you mind? If no, I go right ahead. So, I don't know what it is, but so go ahead. Two of the most hated men, and you know the more the most um, terrifying men in Britain. Lane McCluskey and Jeremy Corbyn will, with Melissa Ben hosting, on the nineteenth of October, do a poetry event in Liverpool. <laughs> so yeah, a poetry event because underneath this, you know, so-called reputation as you know these complete bastards are two of the most humble and genuine and nice men that you could meet, and hopefully Melissa will bring this out. Uh, Using poetry, they'll express what they believe in and what provoked them to become engaged. You've, yeah. you've written poetry? No, no, they're going, no. To, they're going no, to recite we're not, about we're poetry. We're going to discuss the effect the poetry have had on our well, lives. I have written poetry, but I'm not reading any of that. <laughs> oh, it's okay. the, it, listen, it's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. It so could you not, plug event, it could be not, not yes. you know... <laughs> Oh, I mean, the only the reason, 1992 TUC yeah. Congress. <laughs> the only possible reason to read it would be if the event is running over time yeah. and the caretaking staff want us to get out of the building. Yeah. Like I said, Jeremy, yeah. come on, bring it on, read yeah. it out, and then you'll see the people yeah. find it out. Um, no, we were going to be discussing what inspires us in our lives. And... Um, you see, socialism isn't just about the economy. It's not about just about services. It's not just about structures. It's about people and their empowerment and how it's the socialism of everyday life. Mm. And it's also the socialism of imagination. Yeah, and that's it's the what artists, I mean. it's the poets, it's the musicians, it's the comedians. It's people that think outside the box and say mm. things. Poets say truths because they can. Comedians say truths because they can. Artists express it in their own way, which is why I was so determined that we would have fixed, protected funds into every school for art and music education, because mm. that's what inspires the next generation. And that's one of the things, like, Starmer talks about what's the banal bullshit he's talking about today? Working hard, and I mean you. I mean, and again, families. it was no, hard, hard working families. Hard work. But are you, when you spoke, you spoke about love. You spoke about the purpose of life. What's the you know, rather than this dull fucking grind that you, ever, you know, that you talked about. Well, also don't you define know, everybody how, as a family. Right? Don't define everybody as a family. Yeah, well, single, well, single, single people well, also God work hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, if I don't want to work, but it was also that you were, I think, trying to. <laughs> you are trying to move towards, you know, to, to to what the purpose of our existence is, not just a grind where you can buy another yeah. washing machine, but to. To, to live in a better world of, of love and understanding. Ultimately, we've got to get into that world, and that means there has to be a public support for everyone's basic standard of living rather than an ever-growing economy that destroys the very planet on which we live. Yeah. Well, well that is yeah. not going to happen tomorrow. It's a, it's a longer-term process, but socialism is about protecting and extending people's lives as well as the environment. Yeah, because the other thing about capitalism, of course, it depends on a permanent sense of dissatisfaction, doesn't it? Because you have to be convinced the next pair of trainers that you buy is going to make you happy in these ones, you know, and so the, the, the endless yeah. round of consumption exactly. depends on you being... Yeah, you've got better quality trainers than your neighbour. I haven't seen your neighbour's trainers yet. Have you seen them? Or what? He's a barrister. He doesn't really wear trainers. <laughs> 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 you don't want to see... Yeah. You don't want to see a QC yeah, in trainers. Than, yeah, yeah. 14,000 word day. Essay mentions business roughly yeah. 40 times and mentions trade unions three times. Yes. I rest my case yes. about the direction yeah. of the trade union yes. movement. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Right, John. Alexi, thank you very, very much. Jeremy, it's such a pleasure you. to be here with you. And thanks for all that you do. Uh, well, the it's, wit it's, and the humour you bring to <laughs> events, and I've been listening to you for so many years. The problem is, you and I need to get to know each other better because yeah. what happens is, I go into a meeting when you're speaking, I'm up next to speaking, you're already yeah. leaving, all the other way around. Yeah, it's like being comics on the circuit years ago. Yeah, well, we will. This is a start of a beautiful yeah. friendship. A beautiful. Did you ever do the um, Red Rose Comedy <laughs> Club? No, I never did. No, because oh. you financed that, didn't you, more or less? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it, was a, it was a great place. I think I might have done years. You probably went there once or twice. Yeah. Jeremy yeah. Hardy was very yeah. often there. He was a very yeah. loyal supporter of the Red Rose Comedy Club. Well, I've okay, got, got to thank Tommy for helping making this happen. Uh, uh, okay. Tommy Corbyn. The, the, Tommy Corbyn. Tommy the, Corbyn, the, the Twitter-in-chief. Yeah. Who hey. runs the National Hemp Service? Yeah. He's a bloody uh, liar, honestly. Shout out to him. Totally. I met him a couple he, years ago at a gig. So good. Man, I'm so grateful that he helped. Uh, no, he, he rang us. me up and said, hey, Dad, I want something. I said, Well, there's a change. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Jeremy Corbyn doing the Alexi Cell podcast. Yeah. I don't know where we can go from there. I know. Is this the last episode? <laughs> yeah, we might give up after this. Uh, I, um, yeah, I think it was. I mean, Talal said he's Jeremy, like he's never seen him before. Really relaxed. Yeah, open. I was. I was expecting him to be a bit more shielded. Yeah, me too. Holding yeah. back, but yeah. he seemed very candid and. His, you can't see it at home, but his body language was extremely relaxed. Yeah, and it kind of explains. His uh, appearances when he's being grilled by, you know, reporters on television, he kind of takes that posture too. He never seems that. No, I think he, he I mean, to, because they were always so hostile that he, you know, he, he, he kind of got, def I mean, he would get defensive, I think. Uh, but I, you know, I mean, we, I mean, I think one of the interesting things and one of the, you know, I think that nobody else has got before is when he talks about what it is like to be in the middle of, um, all that that barrage of negativity mm. and how that's a deliberate tactic in a under way under siege under so. siege yeah I think he talked about that and there, you know if you get you know some shithead like you know we buy any car dot com Phil mm. what's the shithead called Schofield. Philip Schofield um, you know shouting at your fucking John Snow you know will you apologise. For a completely made up story. Mm. How can you apologize for a made up story? Well, when people are yelling at you like that, it's difficult to, you know. Uh, you, again, yeah, you're under siege, you know. And so, you know, when he's. Um, I think lack of ego. Yeah. Because when he mentioned how, because this isn't stress, and then he told us what real stress is, like you can't argue with that. But then also, like any sane human would be completely stressed <laughs> under that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and uh, I think compare that with fucking Starmer, thin skinned, ambitious little mm. git. Anyway, that's the Alexis Hill podcast number 16, quite a milestone in uh, my our podcast in history. Uh, um, Shit. Yeah. I well. forgot to ask him about D&D. D&D? &D. Dungeons and Dragons. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was going to ask you about Dungeons and Dragons. You look, thank God you didn't. Next, uh, next. Uh, so next week, um, Lexi, next time, Lexi Cell uh, podcast number seventeen will be Xi Jinping, uh, the <laughs> president of China, People of Republic of China. I'll talk to his son. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, Tommy Xi Jinping. See you then. Bye. You've been listening to the Lexi Cell podcast. This show is produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarbush Records. Thanks to Anthony Overton for the sound mixing. And to Audio Boom for hosting us. Please keep your emails coming in at alexiselpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye.